Yes, I do have memories. I was um, six when I left, uh, so obviously I have memories, and uh, some of them are stark memories because uh, uh, there was a war on and uh, uh, Budapest was under siege, and uh, so there was street fighting and so forth. But uh, I don't want to exaggerate because um, amazingly these experiences were not traumatic. Uh, at least I, I don't feel that they were traumatic. Uh, they were traumatic for, for my mother, uh, of course, but uh, not for me. And also, I mean, um, it's easy to overestimate my Hungarian roots at, uh, because I left at, at an age of six and I uh, went with my mother to uh, Vienna and uh, I grew up in Vienna. Uh, these Hungarian roots uh, uh, are much weaker than you might think. Uh, Hungarians are amazed uh, if I tell them, but uh, uh, I don't speak it anymore. I can pronounce it, but I can't speak it. And uh, uh, it's, it's a minor detail, um, with one exception, uh, which is that the historic situation in Hungary and the dramatic situation in which my parents and my mother found itself uh, generated an enormous interest uh, in uh, the history of the Second World War and the background and so forth. So that's, that's the influence, yeah? but uh, it's more an intellectual curiosity um, than uh, a, a deep trauma. My roots are actually in Vienna, Yeah. Um, so um, roots, well, I lived there until I was 27 and I did all my schooling, with one short exception, uh, in Hungary, um, in, in Vienna and uh, I did my PhD there. So um, that's, my, these are my roots, but uh, they have become weaker since, obviously. Yeah. I was about 14, 15, and um, because my father had been an, uh, uh, an artist, um, I felt, and my mother encouraged me in that, uh, uh, that I had an artistic talent, and uh, uh, one of my teachers uh, did the same, and uh, so I decided to become, to study architecture, uh, which uh, in retrospect was not the most fortunate choice, uh, because I I don't seem to have an enormous talent as an artist, and uh, I was very quickly drawn to the, um, the more intellectual side of it. And uh, I did the course, and uh, I did it fairly quickly, uh, but um, the idea was to get to the PhD as quickly as possible, and uh, so that's what I did. Um, and uh, I, I've done practically no architectural work at all. Um, yes, I suppose so, although we didn't express it in those terms, but I was much more attracted to the uh, social sciences and uh, the social science input into architecture was very limited and uh, that's also the reason why I opted for um, the planning because the architecture course at that time was very comprehensive. We had to do everything like architects in those days used to claim that they were able to do from interior design to uh, regional planning. Now we had uh, fairly uh, extensive courses in urban and regional planning and uh, they attracted me and uh, I, sp I didn't specialize because you had to do everything, yes, but uh, I was attracted to that and I became, uh, even before graduation, um, uh, one of the professors there uh, asked me to become his uh, assistant as it was then called and uh, I did my PhD um, in as quickly as possible um, because the PhD was not um, the fantastic intellectual experience uh, that I was looking for either. So I decided very quickly um, that I had to um, uh, fulfill one of my dreams was to study abroad. And so as a, as a postdoc um, with the British Council Scholarship, I went to the University of Southampton uh, to study sociology. So I did a, a three-year potted course in, in sociology on undergraduate level, which didn't give me any particular degree, but uh, it allowed me to uh, orientate myself um, more in the, in the social sciences, and uh, it was very formative for me. Uh, that's really when my education started, I suppose. <laughs> Thank you.
Well, first of all, the course uh, in did include some philosophy, uh, not in any formal sense, but I mean, there was uh, philosophy involved. I started reading Popper, who had a, a great influence on me later on. Uh, and, um, but the, um, the, the turning point came when my um, advisor at that time um, asked me to do a, a short study on American and British planning theory. Now, he didn't tell me what planning theory was, um, and there's an easy explanation nobody knew at the time. Uh, and um, so I started reading uh, American literature, um, which was very rich at that time in comparison to all other uh, uh, literature which there was, including the British, uh, because in America in uh, about 1949, 1950, uh, a social science-based planning course was set up in, at the University of Chicago. And from there, a lot of social scientists entered the field of urban and regional planning and started writing about it, but as sociologists. And uh, so I read that literature and um, I uh, was trying to answer for myself, what is this thing planning theory? And uh, so I identified a few issues uh, in, in this area and wrote about it, not on British planning. I American planning was complex enough, thank you very much. And uh, uh, that was my intellectual luggage. Um, and um, uh, also, I very quickly decided, it only took me a few weeks, uh, that I couldn't go back to Austria uh, because the, the environment was not satisfactory. Um, the, the, the intellectual environment and also the political environment up to a point. And um, so I applied for a temporary junior lecturership at an unknown uh, College of Technology, the Oxford College of Technology, and got it because I was the only PhD uh, that they had. And um, there I was, teaching planning, uh, with no practice under my belt, uh, um, some American planning theory, uh, and um, an interest in planning history. So, And uh, it was really at the Oxford uh, College of Technology, which is now called Oxford Brookes University, um, and has exploded. It's, it's, it's really a, a very good school. Um, it, there I developed my ideas about planning theory further, and I was extremely lucky, um, because right opposite was Pergamon Press, uh, and Pergamon Press had decided to uh, uh, publish a urban and regional planning series. And they asked for advice from my head of department, and my head of department asked me to join him, uh, writing about uh, what a planning series uh, at the end of the 1960s should be about. And uh, uh, on this basis, I was invited to join the editorial board of uh, Pergamon Press uh, of that particular series, met very influential people there on the board. I mean, I was a very junior person, but uh, uh, I met really a, a number of leading professors there. And um, at some stage they said, uh, well, we also want a book on planning theory. So I wrote a book on planning theory based on the reading and, and my lecture courses, which I had developed in the meantime. And um, that uh, hit a raw nerve eh? um, in, uh, because I, it offered an answer, albeit a very controversial answer, to what planning theory could and should be. And what was so controversial about it? Well, I decided, um, on the basis of my reading of the literature, I decided that there was a distinction, and it's no, not entirely original, I mean, uh, uh, but uh, I spelled it out, um, that there was a substantive theory of planning and a procedural theory of planning. Substantive meaning, uh, well, there are theories about urban form, about uh, the effect of uh, designing neighborhoods, positive or negative, uh, the, the effect of having a green belt, or in Dutch terms, a green heart. Now, that's substantive, yes. Uh, and uh, the other type of theory, which interested me more, and I was uh, 
challenged for that was about what is the planning process like? Uh, what, uh, what sort of uh, mechanisms or, or procedures need to be followed uh, in order to arrive at a plan that is defensible, that, that uh, is acceptable? And uh, that's what I wrote about. Um, now, this was challenged, uh, first of all, by traditional uh, architects, pl architect planners who uh, had um, invested in investigating urban form. And, 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 and uh, I never denied that that was an important part of the planning curriculum. But I s simply said, um, uh, procedures are more general, they are more generally applicable uh, than uh, urban form and, and other substantive theory because that differs very much from issue to issue, from country to country, from level to level. But what also unexpectedly, um, when the book came out in 1973, uh, neo-Marxism had hit planning. and. Um, so I was challenged because my theories were not neo-Marxist. I mean, I didn't explain uh, the laws of capitalism and how they affected uh, planning, uh, mostly in a negative sense. Yeah? And so I was criticized uh, from left, right, and center for that. But that gave me some notoriety. I mean, I, I, it became really, I became a kind of bête noire. Yeah? And, uh, um, uh, and also the, the, the additional thing which that book did was it drew the attention of an appointment board uh, here at Delft, um, University of Technology. And um, since I had applied for that job after five years in, in the UK, um, they interviewed me and, um, and they appointed me at a very tender age of 34, which I, sort of, I was very uh, pleased and flabbergasted and excited and uh, I rolled my sleeves up and uh, learned Dutch together with my wife, and, uh, and we came to the Netherlands. So that's, that's why I'm saying I was extremely lucky. Well, to the extent that it is still being quoted, every PhD uh, feels under an obligation to say that Falud is a procedural planning theorist, a positivist, and what have you. And, uh, uh, dismisses it. Uh, over, I mean, there are some people who are more considerate, uh, but it's it's a thing of the past. But it's it's something that people, even without knowing me and knowing my further work, uh, very often refer to. Sure. No, because of the the, the whole intellectual yeah. climate in the in the nineteen seventies and. Uh, because of the controversies that I described just now. I mean, I had the same reactions in Amsterdam. Uh, um, again, a lot of uh, people, the staff at Amsterdam were geographers or uh, people who were focusing on uh, substance. Yes? And uh, um, not just a few were interested like I was in the planning process. And that was a challenge. I mean, I, I, uh, they had to cope with me. and. Uh, uh, so, uh, yes, I, I can fully understand, but I have left this more or less behind. Yes? I mean, the controversy I have left behind. Uh, there, there were various follow-ups. I was, was trying to uh, redefine and reassert what I was trying to do until about the, the middle of the 1980s. And uh, uh, for various reasons, I, I stopped doing that. I'm not part of the very alive planning theory community just now. I mean, there's a, now there's a journal called Planning Theory. Of, I, I'm on the editorial board, but I mean, I, I'm not publishing there because uh, I've moved to, to do other things. Yes. We, we have a particularly warm feeling for Delft, for the center of Delft. I mean, uh, this is an interesting question of identity, yes. Uh, I mean, obviously, yes, we, we have Dutch citizenship, and uh, uh, but what's your feeling, yes? Now, I've, I've read recently that it's typical for immigrants uh, to develop, uh, if they are long-standing immigrants, uh, 
uh, that they develop a very warm feeling for the immediate environment. And, and that's what we, we feel. I mean, I, I speak for myself, but I think it's the same for my wife. Um, in terms of nationality, um, that, uh, that I'm a little bit, um, uh, how shall I say, vague about it, because, but that has something to do also with my current work on European spatial planning and, and the role of nationality in, uh, in, in this work. Um, uh, but once again, very warm feelings for Delft. talking about. One is, I mean, when I had, uh, had finished with planning theory, I, I hadn't done any empirical work on planning theory, yes? uh, case studies and the like. And I had read about them, but not, not done any myself. And uh, even before coming, um, I hit upon a, the opportunity to, uh, do, to, to organize a, a year-long multi-annual uh, comparative study between uh, as it then eventually turned out, Leiden and Oxford. And uh, for various reasons, I decided to study the most routine planning processes uh, that you could imagine, like the issue of a building permit, the decision to build um, a block of flats, and so forth. And uh, we did this with a team of uh, uh, colleagues, former colleagues uh, at, at Oxford, and. Uh, uh, some staff that I had brought along to, to Delft, and this was most revealing. Uh, first of all, it was my first experience of, of confronting planning theory, my th theoretical assumptions with practice, and, uh, uh, and secondly, it was very revealing about Dutch planning. Dutch planning at that time uh, had a, an enormous reputation, uh, but what we discovered was that the actual processes on the ground were most uh, confused and uh, irregular, if you want. Um, and there are lots of anecdotes that I can, could tell. And um, I started discussing this with colleagues. And um, uh, it turned out that uh, two things turned out. First of all, those who knew practice, including the practitioners themselves, they invariably said to me, oh, that's what we do all the time. Uh, but then I said, look, you know, this is against uh, the, even against the law, what you are doing, yes? Uh, um, and rather than complaining about uh, their misbehavior, uh, which I, I thought their adaptations to practice and to the exigencies of practice were perfectly reasonable. So I started questioning the spirit of the law. Now, what's the spirit of the law? It is that plans are there to be observed. That, uh, what's called a bestemmingsplan, uh, uh, a land use regulation must be implemented. There is no discretionary element built into this. And I said, you know, why don't you change the law and change the philosophy behind the law? But that's a crux. The philosophy behind the law is deeply rooted in the Dutch psyche, uh, different from the British. I mean, that's what we discovered. And uh, so that was a big thing. We discussed this a lot, and it... Uh, it also caused me to engage in more theoretical reflection, and methodological reflection, I called it, about uh, planning. Now, the second point is, I then turned my attention to national planning. Uh, in the Netherlands, the, what, the, what was then called the Rijksplanologisdienst did, and uh, found to my amazement that uh, it worked. Uh, hey, there's a national planning system which works. Let me qualify. Again, it doesn't work because plans are being observed very closely. No. But uh, the National Spatial Planning Agency had set out certain ground rules, and in particular, it had created a, a frame, what uh, political scientists call a frame, for looking at the Netherlands and for acting uh, in relationship to the Netherlands, and that's basically the Green Heart uh, Randstad concept. Uh, and uh, right, to my mind, right up till the end of the 20th century, this worked, and there are still reverberations of this in, in current planning. So I 
study that again with the help of a lot of empirical research on uh, planning processes, PhDs who helped me. Um, and uh, one of them, Arnold van der Falk, and I published a book. And that's the book we are referring to, Rule and Order, Dutch Planning Doctrine in the 20th Century. Now again, controversial. Uh, Dutch planners don't want to be labeled doctrinal. Uh, we are not doctrinal, we are flexible. Uh, but that's up to a point it's misunderstanding what we said about doctrine. And, uh, uh, but it, 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 uh, it's, I think it uh, got a certain amount of recognition. Uh, at least I, I notice now that the term doctrine is, is, is used uh, more often than it used to be at that time. Uh, now, uh, just to continue the story, I mean, when I finished the book, and that was in 93, 94, uh, and the book came out in '94. The Dutch planners, of a handful of Dutch planners, uh, were at the uh, National Plan Planning Agency. Were very interested, and for good reasons, in um, European planning, and they made a great contribution to European planning. And I, I started getting interested in in that, and that became my my passion ever since for the past 20 years. Since. Uh, and uh, I must admit that I do not follow Dutch discussions anymore because I'm so focused on uh, European planning uh, that uh, it would be impossible to, to do both. Well, yes, sure. Yeah, there, there is the famous story of the finger in the dike, yes? yeah. uh, uh, yeah. the, the, the boy that held his finger in the dike and, and so forth. Uh, that is undoubtedly an element uh, and it uh, uh, explains some of the specific uh, features of the, the institutionalization of planning and in particular land policy uh, in, in uh, the Netherlands and the role also of planning in relationship to uh, uh, expropriation of what the Americans call eminent domain. <clears throat> um, I think, um, and this is a common story, I mean also foreigners uh, looking from the outside, uh, they uh, observe the same thing. Yes? Uh, there is an additional element um, which I think I have added to this, and uh, which is the role of what I call the planning community. Um, because um, the, the story of the finger in the dike eh, um, doesn't explain why Dutch planning, Dutch national planning, emerged uh, at the time when it did emerge, which is roughly 1950s. Um, um, in order to explain that, you have to really follow the uh, development of the Dutch planning profession and and the role of key individuals uh, who uh, have formulated this doctrine very often for uh, uh, reasons of um, bureaucratic politics. Uh, you, you really have to look at bureaucratic politics too uh, and, and, and find out what the position of this small national planning agency has been, uh, with whom they had to contend and uh, with whom they liaised and so forth. And uh, I find this is also a compelling story of how the, the, the planning community created uh, the Dutch planning doctrine uh, and succeeded for a while, for decades actually, to socialize politicians and the public into believing in this doctrine because uh, Randstad and Greenhardt ha have both been creations of the planners. No, well, not exactly, but Randstad has actually been created as a term by, apparently the story goes, by the director of KLM, who had seen the Randstad from the top. Uh, but, I mean, planners have taken it over, and the Greenhardt, I know, is a, is a, is a creation of a, a director of the National Planning Agency. Uh, so that's the, the compelling story, uh, to my mind, behind Dutch doctrine. So there's more than just Dutch culture. There is the Dutch planning profession um, articulating uh, what Dutch culture is about or might be about.
wrote a paper once in 1996 on, on precisely this. Uh, the title of the paper was European Planning Doctrine, A Bridge Too Far? Question um, mark. And I expressed uh, doubts about whether anything like a, a European planning doctrine on, uh, of, of the kind of Dutch doctrine could be articulated. Mind you, that was when there was, we, we were still talking about the Europe of 12, and now we are into Europe of 28. Um, and uh, what I did uh, for the first years was actually to pursue uh, the, the story of a planning document that uh, um, was drawn up, not technically speaking by the European Commission, but by uh, representatives of uh, national planners in the Europe of 12 and later 15, called the European Spatial Development Perspective. So I did a very detailed, together with somebody else, study of uh, how this thing had happened, because it's an amazing thing. It uh, lasted uh, between seven to eight, ten years, depending on when you say it started, uh, until it was eventually um, uh, published in, in 1999. And um, I learned to know a lot of the people involved from national planning offices. Um, and uh, I began to discover uh, the European processes. Yeah, how, how they actually work. And this is not a really an EU thing. It's, it's something that is done uh, by the uh, planners of the member states, but always related to the EU. And the big question underlying was, should planning become an EU competence or not? That was a big thing. And here you immediately hit upon a problem that is with us now. I mean, talk, talking about the banking union, talking about the euro, everything. What is the role of the EU in relationship to the role of the member states? And the tremendous ambiguity, uh, also in the position of uh, planners, national planners. Yes? Um, and uh, so, I, I mean, the most fascinating thing about this was not the outcome, which uh, one might discuss and, and uh, which uh, on the one hand is very weak, but on the other hand it, it set the agenda again for years to come. Uh, but the processes. Uh, so my old fascination with processes came back again, but it, it was certainly not a rational process. Uh, it was a process full of surprises and political infighting and, and, uh, and you learn a lot about uh, national cultures actually. No, an integrated European no. planning. Yeah, I always uh, say to students when I talk about this, don't expect a planning office in Brussels, yes? There are a handful of people uh, at the Directorate General for uh, what's now called uh, Regional and Urban Policy, uh, which uh, deals with the structural funds. And there are these, there's this handful of people who, at occasions, uh, were interested in this and who originally firmly believed that the European Commission should have a hand in this. I interviewed one of the commissioners uh, after she uh, left office, and uh, the characteristic uh, uh, thing was she came from a country, Germany, which was not keen on, on, on EU planning at all. But she, having been on the inside and, uh, and on the receiving end of uh, the ambiguities of the member states, uh, we were asking her about why this process had taken as long as it had taken. And she said, well, if they had given it to us, it would have been much faster, yeah? uh, which is probably true, yeah? uh, uh, although it would have been different. Uh, so there's this impatience on part of the people in Brussels, uh, the, those who were or sometimes still are involved, in these discussions with the endless idiosyncrasies coming out of this intergovernmental process. At the same time, the intergovernmental process creates consensus uh, for, to the extent that consensus is possible. Eh? So I find great parallels here with what I hear about the uh, Council of Ministers, what I hear about uh, the Euro European Council and so forth. Uh, 
that's right, yes. Yeah. The Blue Banana, yes. Uh, well, uh, I, I need to say a little bit about the Blue Banana, what it is actually. Uh, it comes out of a French study uh, done in 1989, and it was actually intended to demonstrate to the French public and the French uh, planners that France was in danger. Because if you look at the uh, Blue Banana, it straddles Europe, French territory. Uh, but it doesn't include Paris, not in the, uh, in, in, in the original conception. And that was at a time, of course, when the Iron Curtain uh, had fallen and uh, France was expecting to become marginalized. And as far as the west coast, uh, the, the, the western provinces of France, the Atlantic coast are concerned, that is a, a traditional fear. And uh, so this, this would be uh, enforced in, in, in the Bretagne, for instance. Yeah? And so that was the blue banana. Um, and it was later on by others uh, redefined as well, as the core of Europe. And not only that, it, it was actually uh, uh, designed as such, but it was re reconceptualized as a metropolitan core of uh, high density development and so forth, which it is not. The Blue Banana is actually a polycentric uh, urban network. That's what it is. Yes? Anyhow, um, it became all. Uh, related to cohesion policy and uh, to uh, the, the ethos of the EU of uh, uh, spreading development, of promoting the, uh, what's called in technical terms, least favored regions. Yes? And so the, the banana, which they reformulated in, in, in some other way, the banana was the area where you, the money shouldn't go. And uh, uh, the uh, outlying areas, the periphery, that's where the money should go, uh, very crudely speaking. Uh, uh, and this then became entangled with the whole uh, discussion about how to promote the competitiveness of Europe, uh, uh, where there are two positions. Uh, one is, uh, if you want to promote the competitiveness of Europe, you invest where competitiveness is the highest. That means in the metropolitan areas. Uh, uh, and the other one is, yes, but uh, there is also equity. And anyhow, if we can uh, mobilize the dormant potential of uh, uh, the periphery, uh, that too contributes to uh, competitiveness. So that's, that's the discussion. Uh, and uh, in the ESDP, European Spatial Development Perspective, um, that was nicely articulated. Um, uh, that it doesn't pay much attention to the core of Europe, but it identifies the desirability of uh, uh, promoting the growth of global economic uh, competition zones. I think uh, I, I forgot the name now. It's for global economic. Yeah, they are not competition zones, but there is a definition there, and uh, uh, that. Um, articulates this, this particular conflict and the resolution. Yes. Uh, so that's the story of the banana. Uh, and um, it, it was recast as the Pentagon. Um, and that's another story again, because it, um, I, maybe I'll expand on this, because it illustrates what happens in, in, in European negotiations. Yes. Uh, the, it, during the last phase, when this Pentagon concept was introduced, the uh, lead partner was Germany. Now, Germany uh, uh, innocently um, said, this is the, and this is a German word, Städte Fünfeck. And uh, because it's defined by London, Milan, Munich, Hamburg, and, and Paris. Paris. So five, five major areas, and in between uh, are that's 20% of the territory inside with 40% of the population and 50% of the GDP. So that's a handsome figure. It's also sometimes called the 2040-50 Pentagon. Uh, now, how did Pentagon enter into this? Well, uh, the translator, the, the, he simply took the word Städtefünfweg and said in English, that's the Pentagon, which is perfectly correct. But the Pentagon has a different meaning. 
uh, it's Pentagon with a capital P is, of course, the Ministry of Defense uh, in uh, Washington. And the French translator was much more savvy. He said, no Pentagon, and not in the French language. So he called it Le Cour de l'Europe, uh, the heart of Europe. Uh, which is also a good translation. But, uh, but first of all, it illustrates uh, languages and language difficulties in Europe, of which there are umpteen. I mean. And secondly, um, it, it illustrates um, uh, the, 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 the underlying meaning of words, which can be very, very different in different languages. Uh, at the same time, the word Pentagon is so strong that it's now even used in French. Uh, under inverted commas of the lower P. Uh, uh, it, it also says something about planning. Some, if you can create a, an, a, an important symbol. An amusing and informative story. Eh? Uh, because, we're, I mean, all these planners that sat down together, they were uh, talking Euro-English which is a separate language these days, yes? And uh, they think they understand each other, but, uh, and, and probably through the interaction, uh, uh, they, they begin to understand each other, but uh, the, the, there are limits there. Yeah? Yeah. Mm. It's, well, explaining is, of course, central, yes? And, um, First of all, let me uh, specify, I mean, I'm not doing any teaching in the Netherlands anymore because I'm at a research institute. But I, yes, I do teaching at the moment in, in Sweden and in Vienna. That, these are the two places where I teach. And it allows me to re-articulate the message. Uh, it keeps me sharp, yes, and, uh, because I find that during teaching you find, uh, sometimes find better formulations. I, I very often start lecturing on an article that I'm in the process of writing, and the, the article gets changed. Um, so that's uh, the thing, and also my my uh, f way of teaching, I think, I hope, has uh, sort of changed. I mean, I, I used to really stand up and give give lectures. I even I started because I started lecturing in English, which is not my mother tongue. I started reading out of the lecture, and uh, now I do it very differently. And yes, I. I get the best rapport with students, of course, in small groups, um, and uh, that is satisfying. Um, um, I'm not sure how good I am in social contact. Uh, probably not very good. Uh, absolutely, yes. And uh, sometimes, you know, something, something comes to your mind on the spot, yes. I, I don't have notes anymore. All I have is a, a PowerPoint presentation with very, very few key words on it. And I, I find that every time that I reconstruct the argument, that's basically what you do. Yes? Uh, it allows you to respond to the audience, uh, to respond to the local situation, uh, and uh, you, you, you hit upon new f formulations. Yes? And uh, also old ones, of course. I mean, the story of the Pentagon I tell every time. Uh, but uh, yes, that's very in invigorating. Uh, I hope the students feel the same way. But, uh, um. Well, uh, well done. That's the first one. Uh, uh, I wasn't aware of the 400th anniversary, of course, but uh, uh, I always felt that I was, of course, close to the professors of, of planning uh, there, uh, starting with uh, G.J. van den Berg, uh, who was a kind of mentor to me when I was a very, very young professor. And then I knew uh, Henk Vogt very well, a tragic, but uh, uh, I knew him, knew, knew him very well. And I always admired him how he, and I think this is also University of Groningen, uh, defined himself as a Groningen man, yes, as uh, uh, responsible for Groningen and uh, independent of the Randstad, um, independent of the, the metropolitan uh, universities and setting up his own networks because very early on he started developing his own international network uh, 
uh, on evaluation, obviously, because that was his field. And uh, I, I, I applaud this. I mean, I, I very much see Groningen, and I think this is also the spirit of the city as a metropoli metropolitan city of the north, and uh, uh, that's one thing. And I see that uh, Gerard de Roo pursues the same line differently, but uh, um, he is uh, president of ESOP now and uh, has his own contacts and develops them. And uh, uh, so Groningen keeps itself apart from the Randstad, and um, therefore there is no. Uh, there cannot be any domination by the metropolitan universities because um, the two are, uh, they play in different